Amen. Amen. Yeah, I'm going to miss that music, huh? November 13, 1946, a single propeller airplane took off from the Schenectady County uh, Airport with a rather unique payload aboard. Six pounds of dry ice and a rather unique mission. The pilot was a chemist named Vincent Schaefer, who had been conducting experiments at the General Electric Research Laboratory using a GE freezer, uh, chilled down to a, a, a sub-zero temperature. And what Schaefer was doing was creating clouds with his breath as condensation seeded uh, and, and seeded those man-made clouds with dry ice. The dry ice catalyzed a chemical reaction that then caused snowflakes to form in that freezer. Well, a few months later, Schaefer rented an airplane and he flew it into some cumulus clouds then to dump his uh, payload, the dry ice, testing to see if his experiments would actually work in reality. Well, eyewitnesses on the ground said that it was almost like the cloud exploded, that the subsequent snowfall was even visible up to 40 miles away. Now, the science of seeding clouds is a marvel of modern science. But guess what? The idea is as old as the prophet Elijah. So here we are, the week uh, seven of our sermon series, Win the Day. And we're going to complete our sermon series today with the seventh and the final habit, seed the clouds. Now, the first six habits, if you were with us, you'll remember that they were flip the script. Boy, that sound, seems like it was so long ago, but flip the script, kiss the wave, eat the frog, fly the kite, cut the rope, and wind the clock. And now it's time that we seed the clouds, habit number seven. Our text today is in uh, the Old Testament. It's in 1 Kings chapter 18, and I think it was uh, 254 or 56. I think I told you if you're in the church Bible, but you'll find it. But first, let me see it, set the scene for you. What, what is going on here before we read verse 41? It hadn't rained in Israel in three and a half years. The prophet Elijah had announced three years before that that it was his word that stopped the rain and it was only his word that would start it again. Now, what he was referring to, of course, was the power of his prayers, words that, that, that he spoke to the Lord. In fact, we find in the New Testament that, that uh, James recalls this event. Chapter 5, verse 17, he writes, Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. It had been a long and, and disappointing day for King Ahab, and Elijah sent him back to his servants to get something to eat. Elijah went to the top of Mount Carmel to pray and to ask the Lord to seed the clouds and send the much-needed rains. Elijah teaches us to believe big and to pray bold uh, prayers of faith. So if you'll join me now as we get connect here in 1 Kings chapter 18, uh, beginning in verse uh, 41, I'm in the NIV translation of the same as the, the church Bible to honor the reading of God's word. Would you please stand with me? And Elijah said to Ahab, go eat and drink for there is the sound of a heavy rain. So, so Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down to the ground and put his face between his knees. 
Go look in, and toward the sea, he told his servant. And he went up and looked. There is nothing there, he said. Seven times Elijah said, go back. The seventh time the servant reported, a, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah says, well, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds. The wind rose. The heavy rain came on and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came upon Elijah. And tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. In other words, he beat the chariot. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Pray with me. Father, I pray that... You would anoint us like Elijah. Lord, we could use a little rain. And I pray that you would hear our prayers. But Lord, I'm, what I'm asking you is embolden us to pray big prayers. Prayers that only depend upon a God like you that can deliver. Anoint us, Lord, with the dedication to be all about prayer and communication and fellowship with the one God who can make anything happen. And Lord, even if it is to see the clouds, whether it is to bring rain to the earth or to bring your love to pour down upon us, Lord, hear our prayer as we take all seriousness in the power of prayer and come to you with it, the boldness to pray big things according to our faith. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Thank you, church. Please be seated. So how do you seed the clouds? Pastor Mark Batterson, the author of the book, Win the Day, suggests three things. And, and from these three suggestions that I, I want to bring to you today it is to encourage you today, to bring you hope that you will perhaps see much more clear of what the Lord is doing in, around, and through you and, uh, so that we become a more forward-looking people. That is, followers of Jesus Christ who believe big and, and who, are, who pray bold are prayers of faith. So the three suggestions I want to bring to you first is that you see the clouds with prophetic imagination. Secondly, you see the clouds with patient persistence. And thirdly, see the clouds with bold prayer. So look with me, as, and it's on your listening guide as well. See the clouds with prophetic imagination. More than half a century ago, Dr. Alfred Tomatis was confronted with the most curious case of his 50-year career as a world-renowned otolaryngologist. Now, that's a fancy word for a physician who specializes in ear, nose, and throat. And he was visited by a renowned opera singer who had lost his ability to uh, hit certain notes, even though those notes were well within his vocal range. The, he had been to other specialists, all of whom had thought it was a vocal problem. Dr. Tomatis uh, thought otherwise, and so he used what's called a sonometer. That is an instrument for testing the hearing capacity. And Dr. Tomatis discovered that the opera singer was producing 140 decibel sound waves at a meter's distance. Now, just to make more light of that, that is louder than a military jet taking off from an aircraft carrier. All right, and what he discovered was that the opera singer had been deafened by his own voice, that he could no longer hit the notes because he could no longer 
hear the notes. And Dr. Damata said that the voice can only reproduce what the ear can hear. Now, keeping this true illustration in mind, we must recognize that what? All of us have problems, relational problems, emotional problems, spiritual problems. And we think that those problems are our problems. And yet I wonder if most of our problems are actually a presenting problem. That is that they're actually the root, the root cause of our problems is actually a hearing problem. Hear what I have to say here. You see, our ears have been deafened to the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. Hear me. How, do, how does this happen? Well, one reason is the white noise of our culture. That is the, the constant background noise that drowns out what it is, friends, that we really need to hear. You know, here's what I'm getting at. We are so bombarded with fake news, with the toxic 24-hour news cycle on our TV, on our internet, on our phones, that every minute of every hour of every day, constantly feeding our brains with poisonous rhetoric. Now, you might just be someone who is actually caught up and all your attention is on this stuff. I'm talking about whatever distractions that you may allow to enter into this computer center, okay? And it affects your thought processes. Now, if you're saying to me, well, I never hear from the Holy Spirit speaking to me. Well, first of all, I, I'm not talking about an audible voice. But secondly, you cannot even perceive the promptings of God if you've got a lot of trash rolling around inside that runs interference with what God wants to speak into your life. But I'm going to add a third one is, is, is you can't hear from the Holy Spirit if you have not yet trusted in Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. So this same spiritual concept, I've, I, I've been teaching you for years. And after all these years, maybe you'll hear it for the first time again today, okay? But you see, what you feed your brain determines how you think. And how you think determines how you behave, now, if garbage is constantly entering your brain by what you read and what you watch, it will affect how you think. And this has been proven over and over again by all the kinds of different video games that kids play that, that often taints their thinking and their behavior. All right, so when your thinking is bad, then your behavior will be bad and therefore, the consequences of your behavior will be bad, promise you. Likewise, if you feed your brain healthy stuff, like God's word, for instance, right? Your thinking will be cleaner. It'll be pure. It'll be more positive, And so will your behavior. Now, you'll notice how far less the problems that you encounter that you have because you will no longer be the cause of those problems. Likewise, like the, the opera, opera singer, you won't be deafened by the sound of your own voice. Now, one thing I hear all the time, especially when I'm getting into a conversation with some person about spiritual matters. And, and then the person that I'm speaking with gives me all kinds of foolish excuses or reasoning behind why they reject God or the church. And you know, the one thing that I hear the most often is, is that a person will say, well, I'm not into organized religion. What does that mean? That mean you prefer unorganized or disorganized religion? You know, I, where do people get this stuff? I'll tell you where. 
they heard it from someone else. That's where white noise, interference, a regurgitation of, of the news media that you watch or the social media that you follow. The, the, the net result is an ear that cannot hear the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me flip the script. What percentage of your thoughts, your words, your actions are the revelation that you are getting from God's word? Can I ask you that again? What percentage of your thoughts, your words, your actions are the revelation that you are getting from God's word? We, we've got to be grounded in God's word. And when we open up the Bible, God opens his mouth. You need to write that down. See, the best way to turn up the volume on that still small voice is a daily Bible reading plan. Something. And not only reading, but listen, church family. First Baptist family offers you free. Can I hear it? Free. 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 Right now media with hundreds of, of Christian videos that will teach you, perhaps even entertain you with what God wants to influence your thinking with. And we promo right now, meet it right there in your bulletin. It's been there even though you may not have read it. Every single week prior to each worship service, it comes up on the screen right now, media. You know, instead of news media or social media, Try right now media. It's free. So watch this as we come into verse 41. Elijah said to Ahab, go eat and drink for there is the sound of a heavy rain. <clears throat> Elijah hears something that no one else can hear or is even listening for <clears throat> he hears something that hasn't even happened in the past three years how because Elijah has a prophetic ear and that's where a prophetic imagination comes from this may sound a little strange to you so hang with me okay here's what a prophetic imagination is a prophetic imagination is seeing the invisible, hearing the inaudible, and believing the impossible. Uh, and you say, well, wait a minute. Preacher, that doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, that's not natural. That's not normal to see the invisible or to hear the inaudible. And how am I supposed to believe in the impossible? Faith, for with God, nothing is impossible. Amen. Nothing. Now, sometimes it takes the form of a supernatural gift, a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge. Sometimes it takes the form of a, of a supernatural solution, like the spiritual gift of discernment or healing. But either way, they're God ideas. And I would rather have one God idea than a thousand good ideas. Amen? Amen. So how do you get God ideas? Well, it starts with having that prophetic ear. That is, it is an ear that is fine-tuned to that still small voice of the Holy Spirit. And no, it's not natural, but it's also not impossible. It takes practice. But more importantly, friends, it, it requires discipline. It requires a daily dedication of spending time in God's word and prayer. And what I just said is life-transforming. They, they go together like the hand in glove, right? Or 
A love and marriage is like a horse and carriage, right? But it doesn't happen overnight, just like building a relationship with one another doesn't happen in a day. And that's precisely what's happening right here in verse 41. It hadn't rained in three and a half years. Elijah's forecast seems foolish, doesn't it? Right? I mean, it seems like Elijah is out of touch with reality. There's an old axiom I just love. Those who don't hear the music think the dancer is mad. I I just think of a, a child who's dancing only to the music in their head. It's a beautiful thing. So when you exercise this prophetic imagination, others may judge you like you're out of touch with reality, but it is, it is because you're actually in touch with reality. You know, beyond your five senses, well, you know, things that you taste and touch and smell and see and feel. See, you're in touch with what? God, your creator, your savior and Lord. Now, to a lot of other people, that sounds like it's out of touch, but this is just the way God likes it. So secondly, are you all still with me? I don't want to blow your doors off on the last week of this series, but... This is really good stuff. Secondly, let's see the clouds with patient persistence. Patient persistence. In the first century BC, there was a drought that was very similar to what Elijah had experienced. It threatened to destroy a whole generation before Jesus. It, it, there was this man who had kind of like an Elijah-like uh, anointing. Honey the circle maker isn't found in the Bible, but he is found in the Talmud. The Talmud is a, is a Jewish writing that contains the history of Jewish religion as well as their laws and beliefs. Now, according to the Talmud, Honey the circle maker was captivated by this one verse in the Bible, Psalm 126, 1, that says, when the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men who dreamed. We were like men who dreamed. Now, now that phrase is what provoked uh, Honey the, the circle maker, a question that he wrestled with his entire life. Is it possible for a person to dream continuously for 70 years? Now, you hold that thought. So the people asked Honey to pray for rain, and he did. And this is how he did it. He took his staff, and he drew a large circle in the sand. And then he knelt down in that circle and he prayed this prayer. Sovereign Lord, I swear before your great name that I will not leave this circle until you have mercy upon your children. That was a bold prayer. And we're going to get into bold prayers in just a minute. By the way, it rained. Now, in what's called a longitudinal study, researchers repeatedly examine the same individuals over a period of time to detect any changes that might occur in that period of time. Now, these studies have shown that with, as with age, the cognitive center of gravity tends to shift from our right brain to our left brain. The left brain is where logic resides. The right brain is where imagination lives. I catch my terminology, where logic resides, but imagination lives. Okay, now it's logic versus imagination. 
What apparently happens is at some point, most of us stop living out of imagination. And we start living out of memory. That is, we stop creating a future and we start repeating the past. Okay, we stop living by faith and we start living by logic. And that's when we stop living and start dying. Most people die long before the date on their death certificate. This is where many churches are today. No longer living, but dying. They no longer create a, create a future for future generations, but instead they settle to live for themselves in the past. But it doesn't have to be that way. And that's why the Bible says in Proverbs, visions, uh, a vision is a preservative of life. Vision is a preservative of life. Show that up on the screen, will you please? If you have a vision, folks, then you are never past your prime. If you have a vision, you're, you never age out. Now listen, in the Old Testament, Caleb and Joshua snuck into the promised land to scope things out soon after the Exodus. Remember that? They went in to spy. They saw what God had reserved for them and they envisioned his plan for them. Oh, in all their excitement, they went back to report to, to Moses and all of Israel what they had seen visually and prophetically. Others had gone in to spy with them, were filled with fear. And so they outvoted Caleb and Joshua. But friends, who was it that lasted long enough in the wilderness to finally enter into God's promised land? It was only Caleb and Joshua. Everyone else had died. Why? Because they had vision. It was an expression of a prophetic imagination. But guess what? It takes patient persistence and if you want to dream big friends then you've got to think long and you have to uh, uh, play for the long haul you've got to be in it for more than just yourself see what we build here at the first baptist family is for those who come after us it requires not only a prophetic imagination of what could be, and I am absolutely convinced that God has revealed his vision to us already, but it takes patient persistence. Win the day by keep on keeping on, taking that journey together one day at a time all along with a goal in sight, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Now, one of two things happen over time. Either memory overtakes imagination or imagination overtakes memory. Imagination is the way, friends, that we seed the clouds to the second, the third, and the fourth generation. And it takes patient Persistence. Verse 44. The seventh time the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. Now that is awfully small. Wouldn't you agree? But that isn't the issue. Remember what we said weeks ago while we were flying the kite. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. For if you do little things like they're big things, 
then God will do the big things like they're little things. See, the little cloud wasn't the storm, but it surely was the harbinger to the rains that were going to come. Elijah commanded the king to mount his chariot and to return to his palace in Jezreel as soon as possible. Why? Because Elijah knew that God was going to show up and show off real soon. Now, friends, we must attempt things that are beyond our ability, beyond our resources, beyond our education, beyond our experience. That's when God chooses to show up and show off. Now, does it make any more sense to any of you as to why I print at the top of our uplift prayer concerns, pray daring God-sized prayers that only God can answer. That only God can answer. In other words, stretch your faith. Stretch your faith. Now, here's another lesson. When you're faithful here, you don't always experience a blessing right here, right now. Am I right? But God will bless you somehow, some way, somewhere. Can I get an amen from somebody who's believing on what I'm saying? Elijah asked his servant to go look for rain. How many times? Seven, right? That's not an insignificant number in scriptures. Proverbs 24, 16 teaches us that for though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. Now, in the NIV Bible, that phrase seven times is, it appears 39 times in 37 verses, mostly in the Old Testament, but Jesus actually used it twice in both Matthew and Luke. And in the Bible, seven is the number of perfection or the number of completion. So it's used both literally and figuratively. Now, among the 39 times that this term is, is used, seven, seven times is, is used, are the Israelites are told by God to circle Jericho seven times on the seventh day, Joshua 6, okay? Naaman dipped in the Jordan River seven times. Of course, Elijah prayed seven times in 1 Kings 18 here uh, for rain. And these are all ordered by God. So listen, what if the Israelites stop circling Jericho after their sixth circle on the sixth day? What if Naaman stopped dipping in the Jordan River at the sixth time? What if Elijah quit praying after his sixth attempt to pray for rain? You know the answer, don't you, right? They would have forfeited the miracle right before it happened. Seeding the cloud is about patient persistence. We win the day. How? By keep on keeping on, taking the journey together one step at a time, one day at a time in patient persistence. Consistency beats intensity seven days a week and twice on Sunday. You know, if you keep on keeping on, Jesus said it this way, ask, seek, knock. Now, those words are what's called present imperative verbs. And what it really means Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. Don't give up. It's too soon to quit. It's too soon to give up. Patient persistence. Amen. Amen. Thirdly, see the clouds with bold prayer. You can see the clouds in a lot of ways. 
But there is none more powerful than prayer. A bold prayer is a prayer that is beyond your ability, that is beyond your resources, friend, beyond your imagination. It is praying, daring, God-sized prayers that only God can answer. Why? Because it's something we can't do. You're praying for something impossible, but believing that nothing is impossible with God. But a bold prayer is also a prayer, friend, that you have prayed a hundred times. And God has not yet answered that prayer when or where or how you asked. But you don't feel released. I'm preaching from experience right now, friends. You keep praying that prayer with patient persistence. Now, I know it gets discouraging. When when you're ill or you're facing a a mountain-sized problem in front of you, like family and and finances, where it really hurts. I don't know what miracle that you're believing God for this morning, but it's too soon to quit. At the beginning of this sermon series, I told you the story about Pastor Mark Batterson's uh, wife, Laura, who just a few years ago was diagnosed with cancer. And not long after, she came across this question in a piece of poetry about illness that asked her, what have you come to teach me? What have you come to teach me? Problem, mountain-sized problem. You see, when trouble strikes big time, If you don't own it, it will own you. So so we confess what's wrong, we profess what's right, and in the case of illness like Laura's cancer, uh, it, it would be God's divine healing. But friends, in any case, it's about trusting God's plan to move you forward. So you keep seeding the clouds with faith, hope, and love. But there is no expiration date on love. There's no expiration date on faith. There's no expiration on prayer that brings you hope. Now, I know many of you pray for me because you know I need it badly. And I sometimes hear your beautiful prayers because I'm privileged to be able to, uh, to, to pray right there with you. And I do believe that the strength that I receive to endure especially spiritually tough times is the strength that I receive as an answer to your prayers. I couldn't be more serious about this church family, about what I'm saying. I couldn't be more grateful than your prayers. And I have seen our church in the last 15 plus years to go through the good times and the bad. I've seen our church through the drought and I've seen it through the downpouring of God's richest blessings. And I have discovered that the evidence isn't always in the good times because the, the times we need him most Surely the times when I need him the most is when we're staring at a mountain-sized problem. And what it is that God wants me to see is not the mountain, but what I'm staring at is at a great opportunity. So we are the beneficiaries of prayers that we don't even know about. You know, we, we harvest fields that we never planted Uh, We we drink from wells we never dug. We live in homes we never built. God has revealed to us in 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 his vision, we'll call our vision, his vision, and in our mission. And I know he's thinking about nations. He's thinking about generations. See, we think that what God does for us is for us. It's never just for us. And it's never about us. It's always about the second, the third, the fourth generation. 
The underlying theme of our whole sermon series is, has been yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery. Win the day. And Jesus said, as a reminder, as he, he taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Take up your cross daily. God wrote in the Bible, says, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. His mercies are new every morning, every day. Now that is a God idea that we should win the day. And I'd rather have one God idea than a thousand good ideas. See the clouds and win the day. Let's pray. Father, I pray that we are empowered with encouragement about your word to step out someplace that we don't walk by, by sight, but we walk by faith. We trust in you in the big things if we would satisfy you with the little things. I pray that uh, there will be a culmination of all the messages put together that will um, open up the next step, at least for the rest of this year, to the rest of our generation in creating the path to lead families to live changed lives in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our doxology is a praise, and I've always sung this song in the moment. And in light of the sermon today, Seeding the Clouds, we can certainly sing this song praising God for what he's done for us in the past, out of love, what he does daily as he sustains us, and even more importantly, what he will do in the future as we seed the clouds with our praise and our prayers. So let's sing our doxology today, knowing that God makes the difference in our lives. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And the people of God sing, Amen. Amen.